Arnold Schwarzenegger in a bloody hand. Arnold Schwarzenegger playing a futuristic killing machine in The Terminator, which has been the number one box office hit in the country lately, catching much of the movie industry, including two movie critics <laughs> I know, very much by surprise. The Terminator is one of four films we'll be reviewing this week on At The Movies, the movie review program. And joining me in the balcony, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. In addition to The Terminator, this week we'll also be reviewing The Killing Fields, about a man who was left behind in the American evacuation of Cambodia, and Comfort and Joy, about a war between two ice cream companies in Scotland. But first, Gene starts with a romance starring Christy McNichol. Just the Way You Are stars Christy McNichol in something like one of those made-for-TV weepers featuring a different disease or social problem each week. In the case of Just the Way You Are, the problem discussed is learning to live with a handicap. Christy McNichol plays an accomplished flautist. She plays the flute. I knew you knew that. But her social life is a non-existent thing because she's embarrassed about a leg brace that she's had to wear since a childhood disease. And so, after turning away from one man after another, she hits upon a plan to make herself more at ease with herself. She will vacation at a French ski resort and wear a cast over her leg and over that leg brace, and thus no one will be able to guess her handicap, including Michael Aunt King. Well, damn it, I want to go for something. I want to take chances. I want to do things I've never done before. Like what? Like, I don't know. I haven't done a hell of a lot. Have you ever been to Switzerland? No. Let's go to Switzerland. How far is it? About 10 kilometers, right over that month. Oh, we've got to try for it. <laughs> I thought I was going to get sick, especially when we got way up there. It was, I've never done anything dangerous like this. You know? I, I feel so... Alive? Alive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I know what you're feeling. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, he does, see? You feel alive. Oh, wow. That, well, I, that was nice that I feel so there. bored. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was nice that he was there to help her finish the line of dialogue. At any rate... Of course, the payoff in this film is going to be whether Christy McNichol will have the courage to expose her leg and the brace, and then whether that man will still love her. And what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> no, there isn't a lot of suspense in this picture. This is a very strange movie for a couple of reasons. For one thing, Christy McNichol has relationships with a lot of men in this film. A lot of men. <laughs> and as a result, none is very deep or very interesting. Also, McNichol's character seems to alternate between a fairly realistic depiction of a young professional woman at times, when she's playing the flute, and then it turns into a traditional cornball Hollywood portrait of a star playing it being a cute comedian. And mm -hmm. so the problem is that just the way you are is confused about what her character really is. So thumbs down for me. Real big thumbs down for me too. Two problems. First of all, the handicap. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that any young woman in her 20s who has had this problem or this handicap for the past 14 years hasn't come to grips with it well, and accepted it. I, mean, I, I think I, I have a feeling that people have handicaps that they never come to grips with for their whole life. Well, but on the other hand, I have known a lot of handicapped people yeah. who would probably throw their crutches and their wheelchairs at the screen during okay. this movie because yeah. the portrait of this woman is so self-pitying and yeah. so uh, ridiculous to okay. anyone who has a lot of self-pride okay. and self-confidence. Well, even if they had done better with the premise, I mean, given their premise, okay, they still I, don't okay. do a good Lousy job. movie. Second problem, the balloon. <laughs> <laughs> There's never been a good movie that had a balloon in it. You've got Bobby Deerfield. You've got that Disney picture where they were escaping oh, from East Germany. Oh, I got you. You've got Pavarotti yep. where he drops into the food fight by balloon. You're right, except for one film, and you're going to slap uh, your forehead. Wait, 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 around the world in 80 days. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's the only exception, and this one <laughs> proves the basic rule. Uh, okay, next at the movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> as The Terminator. <laughs> The number one box office hit in recent weeks has been The Terminator, a violent action movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger as an avenging killer from 40 years in the future. He is half man and half machine. His skeleton is made out of stainless steel. He's got computers for brains, and that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for his personality. His mission is to kill a young woman from today 
before she can become the mother of a rebel leader of the future. And in this scene, the young woman has just taken refuge in a police station. He'll be perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. I got 30 cops in this building. Good night. I'm a friend of Sierra Kana. I was told that she's here. Could I see her, please? No, can't see her. She's making a statement. Where is she? Look, it may take a while. I want to wait. There's a bench over there. be back. kind of goes right on the list with that scene where Chuck Norris drove the pickup truck out of the grave. Remember that scene? Yeah, but I think, you know, along with your balloon theory, I think you might say that a good picture is never made where someone drives a truck through a plate glass window. Uh, we'll leave that in abeyance because I think I'm going to give thumbs up back. I know I'm going to give thumbs up to this picture, believe it or not. That a lot of foresight. scene is pretty much typical of the whole movie, which is kind of a cross between Dirty Harry and the Road Warrior meet the killer from Halloween. <laughs> the Terminator is nonstop action and violence, except when it does stop now and then to tell the story of another visitor from the future, a man who has been sent back in time to kill the Terminator. And this man falls in love with the young woman who's going to be the mother of the future, and their story is told in strong, simple terms that are surprisingly romantic and effective. In fact, this is a surprising movie. It's violent, it's bloody, it's sadistic, but it is also well acted and directed. It is R-rated. Don't go unless you like strong action pictures, but I must say, I did like it. Yeah, I uh, was rooting for it. I mean, I thought, you know, everyone's talking about yeah. it. That's when I saw it a little bit late, and uh, I was not impressed. I don't know why. Uh, other than to say that the action seemed to be pretty much routine. There was a lot of the futuristic stuff uh, on the planet, on the planet mm -hmm. uh, where this guy's come from, and that seemed to me to be just a rector set toy making. Mm -hmm. uh, the love story that you talk about actually is kind of nice, and yeah. I, would, I think that within that little love story is actually... Uh, a potential for a full-scale film. Mm -hmm. If it had been about that, I would have enjoyed it a lot more. Well, the whole paradox, which I won't give away, but the yeah. whole paradox of who that guy is and the fact that yeah. he and this woman fall in love... That's nice. ...is poignant. Yeah, it is it, kind of sweet, and it takes the whole idea of time travel and makes it into kind of a bittersweet sort of thing. Yeah. Plus, non-stop action, which is probably why the movie is number one at the box office. So, as an action picture, I thought it was pretty well made. As an action picture, I thought it was not particularly well made, uh, but the love story, you're right, is kind of nice. Coming up next at the movies, a story of professionalism and friendship and courage set in war-torn Cambodia. Film is The Killing Fields, and I think it's one of the year's very best, telling the true story of a dedicated newspaper man in Cambodia during the 1970s and the latter part of the Vietnam War, and how he learns on both a grand and an intimate scale the horror of the undeclared war in neighboring Cambodia. War killed more than two million people there. The journalist is New York Times correspondent Sidney Shanberg, and among the frightening things he sees are when an American bomber goes off target and destroys innocent Cambodians, and later when communist Khmer Rouge forces also begin bombing the countryside. He doesn't know how many they expect an attack today. Where's your commander? What's he doing there? No, no. How many mortar rounds do you have? Get up, I'm not happy here. 
said. John, I'm leaving. Sid, come on. Come on. That was Sam Waterston at Sidney Shamberg there at the very end with the white shirt and shoulder bag. And that is just part of the killing field, the war story. The rest of this film deals with the friendship between Shanberg and a Cambodian journalist, also in that scene at the end there, who works as a translator and guide for him. The Cambodian's name is Dispran, and as the threat of violence in Cambodia increases, and the Americans prepare to flee, including reporter Shanberg, he asks Pran if he too would like to leave his homeland. They think that a lot of people are going to get killed. A lot of people. All right, I've arranged for the evacuation of you and your family. So now it's up to you. What do you want to do? Do you want to stay or do you want to leave? And how about you? That's none of your business. Do you want to stay or do you want to leave? I know. You love my family, Sidney. But me, I'm reporter too, Sidney. You know what I mean? And so Pran decides to stay. But other reporters question the reason for that decision, suggesting that Shanberg selfishly influenced Pran to stay. <laughs> Sidney, why didn't you get him out when you had the chance? You had no right to keep him here. Morgan, you've got a funny sense of priorities. I'm reporter too, Morgan. I know he's hard. I love him like my brother. Sure. And I do anything for him. Uh, anything. Goodbye. Tell my wife, I love her. I look after all my children. He doesn't speak any English with me. Please, I don't want anyone to be bad to my wife. And so he walks away knowing that Shanberg and his family will be leaving to, for safety in America. The Killing Field is a major film experience for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's been filmed by director Roland Jaffe in a most realistic TV news manner. Second, the film works as a thriller because it now begins to follow Pran as he tries to stay in alive in Cambodia after all of his friends and family have left, including Shanberg. And Pran is hunted and captured by pro-communist Cambodians, and we wonder if he'll survive. And then finally, The Killing Fields has something very important to say about the way white cultures devalue people of color, be they yellow, red, or black. During the course of this film, we get the feeling that much of this horror is taking place on such a grand scale with the world ignoring it and letting it go on because a lot of people simply don't care that a lot of short, yellow people are dying in mass numbers. Because of that insight, The Killing Field is both a strong drama and a fine piece of reporting. And I'm in complete agreement with you. I thought it was a very good movie, and I also think that it will be on my list of the 10 best films of the year. Mm -hmm. It's opening right now in Los Angeles, New York, Toronto, and places like that. Yeah. To establish itself for Academy Award consideration that opens in the rest of the country, I guess, uh, after the Christmas. Well, I'll tell you, one person of the, the nominees that I think would come out of this would be Sam Waterston as the reporter. Uh -huh. There wasn't a, you know, you and I are both newspaper people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not for a minute did I doubt that he wasn't really a newspaper really man good on the screen. There is one thing about the film that I will observe. There have been two earlier films about people who were left behind in Vietnam, The Deer Hunter mm -hmm. and Uncommon Valor. And in both of those cases, the drama comes when somebody goes back to get that friend or that son that he's mm -hmm. left behind. Right. In this film, there is a dramatic glitch right there in the middle because Schomburg doesn't go back. He stays in New York. Right. He writes, he says, I must have written 400 letters. Well, that isn't good enough. And then we cut to Cambodia and we see the Cambodian getting out yeah. or doing what he has to do on his own. Yeah. And so oddly enough, there's no fictional machinery there to keep that middle going except for our intrinsic interest in the character. But that's the point, which is okay. that we spend time following a Cambodian mm -hmm. 
rather than the great white figure who uh -huh, comes in. Uh -huh. And that's part of the message of this film. It does make it more convincing and more realistic than if we felt the plot machinery were kicking in. If, if, yeah. if, it, if it was a white man saving a yellow man, it'd be mm -hmm. the same old story and the same old problem mm -hmm. uh, in ter movie terms that this film is trying so to So how stop. about a nomination for the Cambodian, too? I thought, really, he was the lead even more than Watterson. He certainly takes over the second half of the film. Yeah. Very well. Good job. Next at the movies, a disc jockey gets caught up in the middle of an ice cream war in Scotland. So I hear you have a friend called Mr. Bunny. I know a friend, or somebody I'm helping. And I'm helping all of them, all the Mr. Bunnies. He is named Comfort and Joy, and it's the latest work from a Scottish director named Bill Forsyth, whose movies just seem to get better and better. Forsyth specializes in small, funny stories about strange, lovable characters. You might remember his movie Local Hero, about how the folks in the small town ganged up to outsmart a big oil company. And covered in joy, his hero is a Glasgow disc jockey named Dickie Bird, whose girlfriend has just left him, and so Dickie's heart is broken. This is the end of the world, so he does what anybody would do with a broken heart. He goes looking for ice cream. An autograph, Dickie. I'm sorry, I don't have a pen on me. I'm sorry. Come on to hell. Let's get out of here. Give us a dedication of these stuff for my mother. Yeah, 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 sure. sure. Tomorrow morning. Right. Have you any man to ban your scene, Mark? Oh, bouncing, bouncing. What, the memories are made of this or something? Ah, lovely. <laughs> that turns out to be the opening battle in a war between two competing ice cream companies, and Dickie gets caught okay. in the middle as a negotiator. Chocolate biscuit. Alan? Yes, please. Maria? Maria, what have you got left? Any kunzel cake? Yes, I have two kunzel cake and uh, some apple pie. Oh, good, good, good. Mr. Bird and I, we have the kunzel cakes. Some biscuit for the boys. Oh, here we slice of apple pie, too. That's a good guess. I wanted some kunzel cake as well. Well, that's a pity, Bruno, because you just have to have some apple pie or yo yo, won't you? So, Aaron. What did Mr. Barney have to say for himself? A lot. He wants to talk. I don't think it could work out good. Mm. Where did you meet? His place? Mm-hmm. We went there, yes. Where? Where is it? Now listen. I'm not taking any side. You asked me to help you talk to Mr. Bunny. That's all. <laughs> wonderful. Covered in Joy is one of those movies where one thing leads to another without any particular feeling that we're caught up in a plot. The disc jockey falls in love with the girl who works for Mr. Bunny, the ice interloper ice cream company. So he tries to deal with Mr. McCool, which is run by some Scottish cousins of the Corleone family. The Mick Corleones. The McCorleones, right. It's all very serious and funny and whimsical. Bill Forsythe has one of the lightest touches of any comedy director around. He never forces his laughs. They just seem to spring up out of his characters, mm -hmm. and he never takes any cheap shots. A movie like Comfort and Joy leaves you with certain feelings of comfort oh, and absolutely. joy. Absolutely. It is yeah. a joyful experience mm -hmm. in the film. It's not like an American comedy, you know, Ghostbusters, let's say, right now, which really slams the mm -hmm. comedy home and is funny in its own physical way. Mm -hmm. This is an airy, light feeling. I call it like ginger, being filled with ginger ale. I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. it's... But this character is good. I would follow this guy into another adventure. The next, <laughs> his next week, this happens over a Christmas yeah. week. Yeah. I'd like to know what he does for New Year's. Mm -hmm. I could see a whole story about that. That's what's good about his comedy, is that the characters are not just cardboard figures. No, four stunts. It's a real Forsyth, person. Forsyth takes real people. They're yeah. offbeat. He looks at them very lovingly. There's yeah. a lot of love in his film. Yeah. And then he also has, he fills the corner of his film with all sorts of little gags. Like in this film, once again, Mm -hmm. We have just kind of a walk-on look-alike contest. And these right. two guys who say, well, I'm Fred Astaire and he's Bob Hope. 
They never looked I know. anything like Fred Astaire or Bob yeah. Hope, and those little jokes are just kind of they're wonderful jokes, revealing that, of human nature. They're wonderful jokes coming on in terms of also loneliness, because he is a very valuable character to Glasgow. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. their morning radio man, the most popular guy, but and nobody loves, loves him. I know, yeah. and it's sad. And so, what do you do when nobody loves you? Go to the ice cream. You bet. Well, let's recap our reactions to the films on this show. Neither one of us could recommend Christy McNichol and the Romantic Weeper just the way you are. And we split on The Terminator with Roger enjoying its action more than I did. We were back in agreement on the Cambodian drama, The Killing Field. And finally, two most enthusiastic thumbs up for the gentle comedy, Comfort and Joy. So two very strong recommendations. Comfort and Joy and The Killing Fields. Next week at the movies, we'll review Falling in Love, which is the new movie starring Robert De Niro and Meryl Streep. And we'll also review Stop Making Sense with The Talking Head. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Thank you.